if God comes first, and since you're seeing this, I assume that God does come first in your life, who or what comes next? The simple answer is your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Over the past few weeks, the gospel readings and sermons have focused on our relationship with our neighbor. We've been challenged to see that our neighbor lives across the street and across the border. We are the world, and our neighbor is anyone and everyone to whom we choose to be neighbor. But you know who often gets overlooked? Our families. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. And sometimes the most difficult neighbors to love aren't strangers at all. Their family, the people we didn't choose. In today's gospel, a man is at odds with his brother over an inheritance. The inheritance should be a great gift that unites the family. Instead, it's a source of tension that divides the brothers. One brother has big plans for himself, plans that are all about himself. And he loses a relationship with his brother over money. The gift has turned to grift. Does this sound familiar? Dividing the assets, deciding who gets what and how much is difficult. Not even Jesus wants to arbitrate that trust. Now, if you're leaving your family an inheritance, Make those decisions now with a trusted advisor so that your children don't argue about it later. And remember that charity begins at home. Charity in the sense of being charitable with one another. Are the things you didn't inherit worth losing the love of a brother or sister? There's more to life than money. One of the reasons people in the world's blue zones live longer better is that they put family first. This means keeping aging parents and grandparents nearby or in the home. It means committing to a life partner and investing in their children with time and love. Putting family first also means putting people before things. In today's gospel, one man stands to gain the whole farm and lose his only brother. Is it worth it? Do you really want to take that grudge to the grave? Put family first. Today's gospel reminds us to be just as charitable at home with family as we are with friends. And remember the order of priority. God, others, self. Don't you want your legacy to be about how rich you were in love? and how you left this world a better place? What people say about you tomorrow depends on how you live and love today. Welcome to worship, welcome to Lord of life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Benevolent God, you are the source, the guide, and the goal of our lives. Teach us to love what is worth loving, to reject what is offensive to you, and to treasure what is precious in your sight. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The gospel for this Lord's Day is found in Luke, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Friend, who set me to be the judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, 
be on guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store all my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will put down my barns and build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared and stored away, whose will they be? So it is, Jesus says, with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we say, Amen. There's three things I want to focus on on this gospel lesson from Luke chapter 12. The first thing is inheritance. The second thing is bigger barns. And the third thing is haves and have-nots. So the first part about inheritance, you know, teacher, tell my brother to share with me. Didn't we just have this a couple weeks ago when Pastor Steve was teaching us, preaching to us about the Good Samaritan? The man comes up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Pastor Steve asked a very good question. What does inheriting involve? Well, it means surviving. You know, it's it's nothing we really do except outlive the person whose things we hope perhaps to inherit. And as we turn that into our Christian understanding of being inheritors of God, of God's grace and goodness of life everlasting, there's really nothing we do. We live, but we live following Jesus' teachings, following Jesus' way, following the way that makes us children of God, inheritors of eternal life. Why we use the name Christian when we say, this is what I believe. So, so that was a little bit about inheritance. Here these brothers are fighting over the gimme, gimme, gimmies. Oh, you know, this could be today's news, not 2,000 years ago's. But Jesus handles it in this marvelous way by telling him a parable of the, I call it the parable of the bigger barn. You know, when you got stuff, what are you going to do with it? You get bigger barns. I'm going to tear down my barn, build a bigger one, put all my stuff in there. I'm going to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And Jesus calls him a great fool, for the Lord demands your life this night. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on in that story. And I have nothing against big barns or little barns or people eat, drinking, and being merry. Um, so, so this goes right for me into the third thing, what it's really about, in my estimation, the haves and the have-nots, right? We're all children of God. We're all inheritors of the kingdom. We don't all act like it. There has always been haves and have-nots. Jesus tells Judas back in the day when the woman uh, breaks open the expensive perfume and puts it on Jesus' feet, and Judas has a horrible uh, attack of the guilt and says, no, teacher, we should have sold this and given the money to the poor. And Jesus says this line that has haunted Christians for 2,000 years, you will always have the poor among you. Or personally, we will always have the poor among us. What do we do with that? What does that mean? We're supposed to look the other way. We're supposed to uh, not think that we need to um, uh, reach out. What, what does that mean? We will always have the poor with us. Have and have nots. We know each other exists. Of course we do. The haves don't have to know that the have nots live, but the have nots have to know that the haves live because the have-nots pretty much depend on the haves for their life. Let me tell you a story. I was invited to a board of deacons meetings. In the old-fashioned days, that's what you called a church council. I was a student at seminary. I was assigned to this church in Lafayette, California, rich suburb, um, one of the richer churches in the East Valley, or East Bay. And, uh, and I'm sitting at this meeting, and they're going over a number of things, and a topic comes up 
Apparently, they uh, initiated a relationship with a Lutheran church in Oakland, downtown Oakland. And they'd done things like giving them um, refurbished choir robes, uh, new Bibles, Sunday school supplies. They, they've, they uh, did a hands-on uh, helping whatever the, the needs are were for that church because their budget um, wasn't nearly as uh, able to fund all those things as, as Lafayette's church was. So at this particular meeting, with all that having been in the recent past, um, the pastor and choir director sent an inquiry saying, we would love to do a choir swap. How about if St. John's choir comes to our Savior's and our Savior's choir comes to St. John's? And I just thought that was a marvelous idea, but I was a visitor. So the chair of the meeting says, I don't think that would be a good idea. And other people just start saying, that's just not a good idea. And finally, someone says, why wouldn't it be a good idea? And the chair didn't hesitate. Well, those people will come here and they'll see what we have and, and they'll never feel the same about their own church. It'll make them feel bad when they see what we have. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was all this concurring. And I, I looked at the pastor and he just was silent. His silence was deafening to me. So here I am, a first-year student. What are they going to do? Kick me out of the meeting? I raised my hand. Could I just ask a question or say a few things? I said, they already know what you have. They already know this is a beautiful church. And you know what? They think their church is beautiful too. They already know what they don't have. They just want to reach out and give back to you for all the things you've been given to them. Silence. Chair kind of <clears throat> clears his throat. Okay, I guess we've ended the meeting. We will re politely reject the invitation uh, of the pastor and the choir director. All right, next meeting in a month. And I just sat there. What do you do with that? That's really how we're going to leave this. They will be made uncomfortable because they will see a beautiful sanctuary. Did I mention it was a black church in downtown Oakland? I didn't know what to do with that. I'm thinking, I love God. I love church. I don't love what just happened. I don't understand the haves and the have nots. Who worries more about what? Well, everyone worries about something, but we're worrying about very different things, and we're worrying, quite frankly, about the wrong thing. Here's a question. Who gets to decide what the haves are supposed to have that the have-nots don't have? Who gets to decide what it is you have that makes you a have? I know, I'm getting kind of crazy in my words, but, but the question is, what makes the haves haves, and what makes the have-nots have-nots? I mean, I think of Haiti. I think of the, the children at Wings of Hope. They sit day after day in a wheelchair because they have cerebral palsy or, or some other paralysis going on. They're too weak to walk. Or some of them never even leave their beds. They're just in these fetal positions for their whole lives. And yet they are loved and held and clothed and fed. And they're taken to chapel and they sing in their own little garbled ways and they dance in their little wheelchairs and they they don't know their have-nots they have no clue their have-nots because they have everything they need and they know they are loved they know they are loved by god and yes they don't have fancy houses or fancy cars they'll never drive they'll never know uh, what a vacation is yeah they're never going to know some of that stuff but even if they did, it wouldn't matter to them. They have all they need. They are haves. And I go there and I feel like I have not. You know what I mean? To be around that much love and care and they just reach out to you, not knowing language, not knowing a whole lot of what's going on, but they know that they're going to be picked up and held and loved and fed, played with, cared for bathed. They know all these things will, will happen for them. They have it all. What is it they have? 
So let's go back to the scripture. I'm going to jump way back to the Genesis story. When, when God is blessing Abraham, and Abraham's blessed with lands and riches, and he's going to have descendants and as numerous as the stars, and, and God says, but Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing. Oh, okay. We don't just build a bigger blessing barn. We figure out a way to be a blessing, to use our blessings. That makes sense. And then what Jesus says to those brothers, you know, get over yourselves. Quit the gimme, gimme, gimmies. He says, you be careful because having possessions is not what's going to make anybody's life worth living by themselves. And then that last line, that last line. Jesus teaches us that where our hearts is, there our treasure will be. And he says, one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Be rich toward God. Be rich toward God. We are all haves. I mean, really, in this world, we can say they're haves and have-nots. But really, whose eyes are you looking through? If you look through the eyes of God, we're all haves. And perhaps we're all have-nots. If we don't see if we don't see what we need to do to share blessings, to reach out in love, to stop thinking about bigger barns, to start rejoicing in everything we have and what we can do together. St. John's Lutheran Church in Oakland went on to partner with another congregation and share choirs and vacation Bible school teachers and had a rich and rewarding experience and Lafayette was a lot poorer for saying no to St. John's. Who were the haves and the have-nots there? Look through the eyes of God. Hear the words of Jesus. Don't store up our treasures here. We know not to do that. Possessions don't make us happy. God is the only way that we will have life abundantly. Amen. the whole church, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. O God, your wholeness, where there is division in your church, bring reconciliation and healing. Guide the work of theologians, Sunday school teachers, seminary professors, and all who provide instruction for the building up of your church. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are the source of all life. Where creation cries out in distress, bring relief and renewal. Bless farmers, ranchers, and all who provide our food. Nourish the land and its inhabitants. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are wisdom. Where nations and communities yearn for peace, bring justice. Strengthen those who toil for the welfare of others, especially military personnel, police, first responders, and people who are active in their community for the civic good. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are life. Where people are overwhelmed with the busyness of life, bring encouragement. Accompany all who experience emotional, mental, or physical distress. We lift up especially those in our, among our family and friends who stand in need of your healing hand. Renew us at the table of mercy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O God, you are our treasure. Where scarcity and anxiety pervade your church, Bring abundance and vitality. Guide the work of church councils and committees and give them clarity for the work of the ministry in this place. Merciful God, receive our prayer. And finally, O oh God, you are the resurrection. We give you thanks for all your saints. Inspire us by their example of faithful living to set our mind on things above, and to be rich in love toward you and toward our neighbor. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>